Today's presentation will focus on the design and interpretation of case control studies. During this presentation, you will learn these key concepts, the design of case control studies, considerations for the patients included in control groups, and potential areas of bias. A physician asked you about some new literature regarding clodostrapsin. There was a case control study by S. Arcoma and colleagues in the Journal of Abnormal Findings that reported that the odds of developing cancer were increased by 10.4 fold for patients who received clodostrapsin. The physicians no longer wish to use this medication, which has proven efficacy. How would you assess this article based upon the type of study methodology used? Are the physicians' actions appropriate? Let's further examine this case control study. This type of study is very useful for studying rare outcomes such as fractures or cardiovascular events. Because the outcome has already occurred, the focus of the study is the presence or absence of a predetermined risk factor or factors such as immobility for fracture or poor diet for cardiovascular events. Case control studies are used to assess risk factors for disease. They are retrospective because the outcomes have already occurred and they are hypothesis generating. Cases, or the group with the outcome, are studied for the presence of a predetermined exposure or risk factor. Other information such as demographics and comorbidities will also be collected. The same information is collected for the controls, or the group without the outcome. The measure of association that is calculated for case control studies is the odds ratio. This differs from relative risk because the outcome has already occurred and we cannot comment on the incidence of disease. The odds ratio may approximate the relative risk for diseases that have an incidence rate of 10% or less. In the clodostrapsin study, the exposed group has 10.4 times greater odds of developing cancer as the non-exposed group. The odds ratio will always be in comparison to a control group. Now let's discuss the types of control groups that may be selected for case control studies. In a case control study, the case always has the characteristic of interest. In this example, all of the cases have received clodostrapsin. There are two different types of control groups that may be selected, subjects who received other therapy for a blood clot and subjects who have not had a blood clot. The interpretation of the findings will vary based on the type of control group selected because risk factors differ between the control groups. Control group A includes subjects that have received another type of therapy for a blood clot. These types of subjects would be selected if the objective of the study was to assess risk factors associated with a specific blood clot therapy in patients who have experienced a blood clot. Control group B includes subjects that have not had a blood clot. These types of subjects would be selected if the objective of the study was to assess risk factors for developing a blood clot. The number of controls for each case is as important as the type of controls that are chosen. Luckily, there have been statisticians that have calculated the most efficient case control ratio. Statistical efficiency is calculated by taking into account the number of controls per each case and estimated variance. This efficiency looks at a 1 to 1 ratio, a 1 to 2 ratio, and so on until one case is mathematically matched to an infinite number of controls. The benefit that you receive for matching each case with a certain number of controls is compared to standard matched pairs or a one-to-one -one ratio. The statistical efficiency does not increase by a large amount after a one-to-four ratio. If you matched based on a one-to-five or one-to-six ratio, the benefit would only be incrementally better than a one-to-four ratio. Taking into account bias is essential to the proper interpretation of case control studies. Due to the fact that case control studies are retrospective, there is the possibility that the risk factor has occurred after the disease. It is also important to critically assess the control group subjects. These subjects should be similar to the case patients, especially in terms of other risk factors and other covariates. For example, when comparing patients who have received clodostrapsin to controls, you would want to make sure that the control group had a similar mean age as the cases and that patients in both groups had approximately the same number of comorbid conditions. As with any retrospective study design, there may be residual confounding from unmeasured factors that cannot be corrected with statistics. Now let's take a closer look at the study by S. Arcoma and colleagues. Risk of Cancer with Clodostrapsin Use in the Journal of Abnormal Findings. The objective of this study was to determine whether the use of clodostrapsin is associated with an increased risk of cancer compared to patients who did not develop a blood clot. S. Arcoma and colleagues 
performed a case control study in hospitalized patients at a large academic medical center. The cases included patients who had received clotostrapsin for a blood clot, and the controls were patients who did not develop a blood clot, matched based on the calendar year of admission. The odds ratio for the risk of cancer associated with clotostrapsin use compared to patients without blood clots was 10.4. While this result is statistically significant, it is important to interpret the odds ratio based upon the comparison used. Taking a closer look at the results reveals that the initial odds ratio did not include the effects of age or other confounders such as a family history of cancer. When the odds ratio was adjusted for age, it decreased to 4.37 and was no longer statistically significant. When the confounder of family history of cancer was also included, the odds ratio decreased further to 1.07. The authors concluded that clotostrapsin is associated with an increased risk of cancer and recommended against using this medication. Now let's review potential flaws in the design and interpretation of the findings of this study. In this study, the case control ratio was not maximized as it only used a one-to-one -one match. The control group with no blood clots would have been more appropriate to study the risk of developing a blood clot rather than as a comparison group for a medication effect. These patients did not have a blood clot and therefore they have different risk factors than patients who have experienced a blood clot. The use of clotostrapsin was not the only variable that was different. It would have been more appropriate to select a control group that had developed a blood clot but was treated with a different agent. There were several confounders that were not accounted for in the conclusion, including age and family history of cancer. Cancer is also an independent risk factor for a blood clot and this was not included in the study. To summarize, case control studies are hypothesis generating and causation cannot be shown. It is important to assess potential confounders depending on the type of controls and objectives of the study and interpret the findings correctly based upon the control group utilized. You conclude that the physician's actions are not warranted and that the evidence from the case control study does not prove that clotostraption is associated with cancer. Based on the risk-to-benefit ratio of this medication, you have a discussion with the physicians regarding your concerns with this study. The physicians agree that this is not enough evidence to discontinue use of clotostrapsin. In this case, further study is needed to show an association between clotostrapsin and cancer.